And I think uh, we can start. Thank you very much, everyone, for attending this panel. I am very happy to have a great list of uh, panelists that join us on this panel of managing the pandemic through contact tracing apps, organized by the Cybersecurity and Privacy Institute in collaboration with the Defense and Security Foresight Group of the University of Waterloo. And uh, you can see our four panelists uh, that uh, are speaking today on this topic. We have Besma Momani, who is a full professor and interim assistant vice president of international relations at the University of Waterloo. She specializes in international security and affairs, politics of the global economy, and Middle East affairs. She's also the lead of the already mentioned Defense and Security Foresight Group, a network of defense scholars from across Canada funded by the Department of National Defense. Hello, Besma. Thank you for being on this panel. We have Plinio Morita, who is an assistant professor in the School of Public Health and Health Systems and the J.W. Graham Information Technology Emerging Leader Chair in Applied Health Informatics. His research program explores the use of IoT and mobile health for improving public health data collection. Also, thank you, Plinio, uh, to you for being on this panel. And last but not least, we have Douglas Debeller, who is an associate professor in the Department of Combinatorics um, and uh, Optimization. His research is in applied cryptography, and he works on improving the security of internet communications and designing cryptography resistant, cryptography resistant to quantum computers. Again, thank you very much, uh, Douglas, for being on this panel. With this, I would like to start our discussion. And uh, uh, we all know the context. Uh, contract tracing apps are being developed uh, all over the world, uh, now also in Canada. Uh, the uh, uh, Ontario and uh, Canada have announced uh, that they would like to uh, uh, agree on a joint app. And uh, uh, with this, I would like to first uh, start with Douglas. And Douglas, could you please tell us what do you think is most important in the design of a tracing app? Thanks, Florian. Uh, thanks for organizing this event and inviting uh, me to participate in it. So uh, for the design of a tracing app, I think there are kind of three issues to consider. Um, uh, for me, at least, they're effectiveness, privacy, and transparency. So for effectiveness, the system has to actually be effective at achieving the goals that it's trying to uh, achieve. And I think it's important to delineate, delineate a few different goals that the system could be trying to achieve. Um, because we're seeing contact tracing apps, well, we're seeing apps around the world that have different goals, but are all being lumped into the category of contact tracing apps. So I delineate four um, different goals. Uh, there's what's called exposure notification. So have I been uh, exposed or near someone uh, who tests positive? There's automated contact tracing, which is trying to come up with an uh, answer to who has been near whom. Um, there's symptom monitoring, where people self-report uh, their symptoms uh, for analysis uh, and data collection. And then there's uh, epidemiological analysis, which allows public health authorities to, say, identify hot spots or make public health predictions. Um, so I think we need to be clear about the potential different goals and what can be done in an effective way uh, with respect to those goals. Now, in Canada, the system that we're looking at right now um, between uh, the provincial government and the federal government is focused primarily on exposure notification. So answering the question, have I been near someone who tests positive and giving that answer to me? Um, and so, uh, it, you know, we want to assess whether this app will be effective at that goal. Now, the next category of things that are really important to me in the design of a tracing app are is privacy, so is it minimizing data collection? Is it uh, allowing individuals to retain control of sensitive information like their location, their habits, their health? And finally, transparency. Um, so is the design of the system, uh, 
well, is the system deployed in a way that allows us to have confidence in its effectiveness and in its privacy? Are we able to inspect the design? Are we able to inspect the source code? Are we able to learn about uh, the progress of the deployment as it's going on? So those three things are the most important to me, effectiveness, privacy, and transparency. All right, thank you very much, Douglas. Plinio, from a health science perspective, what would you see as the most important things in a design of a tracing app? There are a couple uh, different areas that we need to, to look into, like both from the, from the perspective of the, the, the population themselves, but also by, from the perspective of uh, our public health agencies. Right? The exposure notification app, that, as Douglas mentioned, that, that's the one that we're seeing in Canada, that's definitely very, very effective because it will tell people like, if they are at risk. So it puts the burden, it puts the responsibility of acting on the person themselves. Right? It would be the same as receiving a call from the public health agency, letting you know that you've been in contact with someone that's, uh, that, was, that, that, that had COVID-19 through the, the regular exposure notification that we have today to, through the regular contact tracing. However, as, a, uh, as we know, humans are, or individuals are really bad at uh, following those rules, as, as we can see all over uh, the world, right? Like in the US, that is very, very transparent. Like I'm from Brazil, so same thing happening there. Like people are not following the, the guidelines. They're not following the regulations, even though they have been, no when they have been notified of being in contact with someone that had COVID-19. So a neat, like, I think what we're gonna see on the apps around the world is this shift from an initial contact notification app a standalone contact notification app into systems that are a little bit more complex. But with that will come the lessons learned from the deployment of these uh, simpler apps. Okay? So uh, what I see in the next year or so are a transition from uh, like basically apps starting as simple contact notification as, uh, as Douglas mentioned, and then new features being added as they become more and more successful. The, we need to, of course, to be careful with privacy because many of the other solutions that, that Douglas mentioned have added uh, privacy concerns, bring added privacy concerns to the users as more and more data start being collected by individuals. But uh, from an from a individual perspective, like let's think about the, like, the, like someone in the community that is being told by their, their province or their, their government, federal government, that there is a contact tracing app available for them. I think we need to think about a couple of things. First, the user experience or the user, user interface behind the app. It needs to be extremely simple, right? Like we're not talking about an app here to help people manage chronic diseases. It's literally an app that will tell you if you've been in contact with someone that was at risk or that had COVID-19. So the simpler the app, the better. Uh, the, the, that will lead to uh, better let's say market insertion or pervasiveness, right? Because these apps, in order for them to be successful, we need high, high adoption rates. What we've seen across the globe right now are some of the apps that are uh, currently being used, they're only reaching 20 to 30% of the population, even in countries that have high levels of trust from their population. So if we want these systems to be successful, we will need a very strong integration. It's not just about deploying the app and having something that looks good. It will be about our government incentivizing people to use it and, and as we go along showcasing the benefits of that application. Uh, when we think about the, the, the 60 to 70 percent of the population that needs to download the app to make it successful, that doesn't need to be at the country level. Right? Like if we have, let's say if we had an app that had 70% per pervasiveness here in Waterloo, for example, there would be a benefit for this local community. So what, do, what I think we're going to see across the world are these pockets of cities that are downloading the app a lot and then showing success so that as we go along and evolve in the pandemic, other cities and other communities will start to learn from that positive impact that the apps have caused and consequently start downloading it more often. Okay, thank you very much, Plinio. And uh, Besma, uh, from a political perspective, what would you add to this? Um, I mean, I guess the one thing, I mean, and, and both Douglas and, and Plinio have put, pointed out, I think, a lot of the concerns uh, already in the sense of, you know, trying to ensure that we preserve people's privacy, 
Uh, adoption rates is a really big one, and you really do need political trust uh, in government, particularly because this is government that's deploying it, and, and we can talk about where there might be down the road discussions of employers deploying such a contact tracing app. I've heard that a couple of times already too. Um, but look, I think the, 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 the challenge is, of course, is that you're not going to get 100% adoption. Well, even the, even the modest 70% that, that people are talking about is extremely difficult. Um, you know, South Korea, look at Iceland, all places where high government trust, uh, a lot of people are very much, um, you know, communal in their approach to things, uh, small places, very dense, and they couldn't get past the 30%. So it's really gonna be hard to do so. And what worries me is that eventually it's a slippery slope to saying, okay, now we're mandating people to do it. Um, and that we saw in India, for example. So in India, they've actually made it pretty much mandatory. You could get fired, you could get fined. Um, we know that Apple and Google have kind of um, made it restrictive so that it's not forced. Um, you know, in other words, it's not automatically done. You do have to download the app. Uh, Apple and Google have said we're not participating in government's requests to basically force people to have it on their phone and, and remit, remit the information to government like Iran had tried. Um, but, you know, just even uh, that, you know, putting fines and legal, uh, you know, restrictions on people if they don't have it, which is what the Indians are doing, um, is still very complicated, right? And, and I'm worried about that, that slippery slope into where, you know, governments that are very autocratic, India is being increasingly one of them, use it. And we're seeing already uh, governments, uh, frankly, selectively, you know, allowing uh, these contact tracing apps to not just have the one feature that uh, Douglas and Pliny are talking about, which is to tell you whether you've been beside somebody, but also embedding in that permits to, to leave your house, uh, permits to allow you to um, go to this area and to that area. I mean, once you start adding different functionalities, um, you know, it does, to me, sound a lot like Big Brother. We've talked a lot about this, you and I, Florian, before, about, you know, 1984. And, and that, that worries me, because I think uh, there is an incentive increasingly, when you look at China and you look at other countries where, you know, uh, this kind of digital surveillance uh, has become a really important part of population control. Uh, I am worried about um, this becoming a very convenient tool for policing, for um, all aspects of surveillance and monitoring public safety. It's a very attractive tool. Um, and I don't think it's uh, something that I want uh, any government to have a handle on because we know that power corrupts and, and that's something that political scientists we spend a lot of time looking at, which is what can happen when you have this you know, very uh, you know, seductive tool at the hands of government. It doesn't end well for people's civil liberties. Thank you, Pesma. Thank you very much for this opinion. We already already touched upon uh, my next question, which is uh, what concerns you about the design of current apps and what do you think is the impact uh, on people and then why are so few people are willing to install the app? So it's back to me. Sorry. Yes, back to you, sorry. Okay. Um, look, I mean, I think people are, um, inherently suspicious. And, and I think that's a good thing. Um, and I think when you have critical thinking skills like many Canadians do and, and folks in liberal democracies, um, we're, we're skeptical. Uh, we're not just going to be the easy followers, right? Uh, you know, and I think that's why it's going to be very difficult for us to find this kinds of adoption rates that are necessary to make it effective. Um, and that's a good thing. And, and I just want to point out that, you know, a lot of people have argued, you know, well, what's different about the government knowing where you are than say, say Google, right? Or other forms of what's been called surveillance capitalism, right? I mean, you know, you turn on your, your computer and you know that there's a lot of, you know, cookies and back functions uh, that is, is basically transmitting a lot of information about you as an individual. Um, so why, you know, why should we be afraid of government? Look, I'm not afraid of my government per se, but the reality is that, you know, government has a very different tool at its disposal than say Google and other private companies. It has, it has very important forces like an army. It has very important forces like being able to, in a municipal sense, to deploy police forces. Um, we know that, you know, in, in this time and era of, you know, talking about systemic racism, that isn't necessarily deployed evenly across different social groups. 
Um, you know, there's so many aspects of this that worry me. Um, and I just don't want us to see, to see us as a liberal democracy fall into that kind of red zone. Now, I know it sounds very fictional and perhaps, uh, you know, um, again, you know, reading 1984, one, you know, can't help but feel like, oh, that's not going to happen here. But, you know, there are all these things happening across the world. Uh, and I'm sure that many places like China, where you see the Uyghurs are being monitored 24-7, uh, where they have social credit systems in place, all these other high-tech surveillance aspects of their lives. And I think to myself, like, they didn't think they were going to be where they were 10 to 20 years ago. Um, and so that's the fear for me, is really that slippery slope. Um, and also, last but not least, I just want to make this pitch that, frankly, the, the non-digital way of contact tracing, which is good old analog telephone systems, work, right? I mean, you know, look at Germany, Florian, you know, your home country, they're doing a great job. And all they do is employ smart people to sit behind a phone and do the contact tracing apps or contact tracing method uh, in an analog sense of talking to people. And it's great. It works. And uh, there's no shortage of unemployed people in this country right now who could use a good job like that. So, I mean, I just feel like it's not necessary. We have a tool already at our disposal, an analog one, um, and the digital surveillance a slippery slope concept is one that worries me so that's really why i'm not in favor of it all right thank you very much for that opinion uh besma Plinio, uh you touched on aspects like user interfaces uh what would you add to the the question of uh uh why users are not willing to install the app and what concerns you about the current design of apps i think one of the <clears throat> one of the concerns right now like and this this applies to whatever decisions we make about our own data, right? Comes to the trade-off between losing a little bit of your privacy and the benefit that that can have for you or and the society as a whole. We've seen countries like there are probably like 70, 80 different groups around the world developing some sort of contact tracing or exposure notification apps. And there's still very little evidence that they really, really work. Right, like as Basma mentioned, we do have very, very use, very powerful tools that could be used for contact tracing. Like we can employ people to call, like to, just to call people that have been di diagnosed with COVID-19. And for Canada, that is something uh, fairly, fairly feasible. Like uh, being a rich country and having, like uh, as Basma mentioned, like a, a, an unemployed workforce that would be available for something like this. But I often, cons I'm often worried about larger countries, right? Like while like I've seen in the past in public health, uh, if you look at the, um, the TED talk by Larry Brilliant in 2006, if I'm not mistaken, he talks about the ways they, they did uh, public health surveillance in, in India. And they used millions of volunteers going door by door, checking on people, making sure that they didn't have certain diseases. So like that level, that scale is something that concerns me, especially in a uh, pandemic like the one that we're living right now. So I think what we're going to we need to see is just uh, more evidence that these apps are really really successful and that are re really improving contact tracing and curbing the pandemic. But also, like I think it all, all goes back to the country that's behind the the deployments, right? Like Canada, like we we have uh, we are we are trusting society compared to other countries around the world, and we have a reason to do that, right? Like we are our government is relatively transparent and like compared to others around the world like i trust i can say that i personally trust my government but if you if you go to like other countries or other more authoritarian countries around the world you may start seeing some features embedded into the app that are as basma mentioned that are that have like secondary uses and that may be affecting per, uh, the population liberties one of the things that need to happen like whatever apps go out in the market the code needs to be made available to the public. We need to be able to inspect what that app is doing. The society needs to be able to confirm that that app is only doing what it's supposed to do. Uh, thank you, Plinio. Uh, Douglas, uh, from a technology perspective and a cryptographer's perspective in your case, uh, what would you uh, see as uh, the reasons why people are not willing to install the app and uh, 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 what concerns you about the design of current apps? Right. So from the design of current apps, there are really, you know, two pieces of technology that are being considered. There is 
uh, Bluetooth, which is being used to uh, is, is for short range communication and is how phones advertise identifiers and are, which are used in the exposure notification apps to, to record who's been near whom. Um, and that's all, that can almost all be done uh, very local with, with no centralized data collection. And that contrasts with GPS-based apps, which are recording your actual latitude and longitude and typically uploading that to a centralized database uh, where the contact tracing uh, and exposure analysis can be done uh, centrally. And so it's those second ones, the centralized data collections, uh, GPS information, that, that really concern me um, because there's uh, such a greater uh, risk to privacy and gives governments so much more surveillance uh, information, uh, you know, tying into many of the concerns that Besma raised. Um, so I, I'm very concerned about apps that, that take that, that second centralized approach. And early apps we saw coming out uh, seem to be taking that approach. Um, the Google Apple API that's now available um, it is the, the former approach, the Bluetooth-based approach, um, and that concerns me uh, much less. Um, I'm also worried about, sorry, go ahead, Florian. No, no, I just wanted to ask you a follow-up question. What do you think is the impact of uh, uh, this type of development of earlier apps using GPS and uh, people uh, not willing to use apps? Right, so I think it's burned a lot of goodwill. Um, so there, if, if, People don't want to be surveilled. That, that's, I think, a fairly universal uh, statement. And so if the system that they were first exposed to uh, was, was very invasive, drained their battery life, um, they hear bad stories about it getting hacked all uh, in the news, um, that's going to turn them off um, even well-designed privacy-preserving apps. So I think that's, that's a significant concern. And it also uh, clouds the message. So uh, you know, Plinio mentioned there are you know, 80 plus apps de under development worldwide. Um, and so if you hear that one has been hacked, um, even if it's not the one that you're using or your design, um, you know, it still gives you a negative view of these systems. Um, and many of these early apps and, and even current apps are moving very quickly. And it's very easy to screw up security when you move this quickly. So there are examples of poorly implemented apps that are sending more data than they should. Like some of these apps used software development kits from Foursquare and Google, I think. So they're like uploading advertising information to Google. And, and we definitely don't want that. And I don't think that's intentional, but it's just, you know, you move quick and you break things. And then, you know, these centralized systems are also very lucrative hacking targets. So I'd be cautious of that. All right, thank you. Thank you for that opinion, Douglas. Um, we've heard the term transparency actually from every one of you, I think, already. Um, and uh, I wanted to get your opinion on what measures of transparency should be taken during the deployment of an app. Plin Yu, why, why don't you start? One of the concerns that I have with, with, for, with contact notification apps and any app that hits the market is the type of users that we're targeting, right? Like when we're designing apps for patients with chronic diseases or we're designing apps to help, patient, to help with telehealth uh, delivery, right? Like allowing patients to connect with their, with their care providers, we're often looking at a narrower subset of the population and then we design the apps accordingly, right? So designing for that specific type of user. So we're talking about like sometimes designing apps for seniors that require larger fonts and easier interaction with it. Others, uh, other apps are designed for, uh, for teenagers and you need to incorporate some sort of rewarding mechanism for them to actually interact and use it. Uh, but now we're talking about a contact tracing app that we want 34 million people across the country to download it, or a percentage of that, assuming that uh, there will be the ends of the, uh, the spectrum, like the, the very young and the very old ones uh, would, not be, would not be downloading it. But the, the reality is that we need to be very careful with how we design this app. And uh, transparency comes back to uh, always uh, keeping the public educated about what's happening with it. If we want this app to be successful, we need our prime minister, we need our premier to constantly update the public about what's happening with the deployment. We can't just have like the app being announced and made available to the public 
and then our politicians going going silent about it. We need to have this content, constant conversation with the public so that they are educated about what's happening in that realm. Thank you, Plinio. Besma, you're deeply embedded in the political processes in Canada as an academic. Uh, what is your opinion on this? Yeah, and you know, um, uh, I know that, uh, you know, the CPI has been really advocating uh, quite heavily, and I think rightly so, to, to basically do like a peer review of, of these apps across the country. And I think that's a really smart opportunity for um, academics to have a, a, a say in this process uh, at the end of the day. Um, being able to provide that peer review, that critique from uh, an outside group of professionals and experts is wonderful, and I think that's a really important point. Um, Douglas mentioned earlier, you know, you know, being very uh, open about the source code. I mean, I think the Alberta one, from my understanding, you know, wasn't very clear at the beginning. Before, you know, we didn't know exactly how they were doing it. Even there was just basically a very um, kind of standard PR advertisement for it on their website. So, you know, as much transparency as possible is really helpful. Um, and again, the protection for, um, uh, for Canadian civil liberties is very key. I mean, I think there's also an opportunity and a need for public debate about this, um, you know, especially, um, you know, not just from, with all due respect, the technical experts are fantastic, but some of the legal um, aspects of this. What are what are the ethical concerns, right? I mean, I want to just point out in South Korea, for example, um, they found out that there was uh, one individual who attended five different um, gay bars in a row, and then um, you know basically everybody that got a notification, uh, he was he was uh, had um, asymptomatic carrier COVID and then became uh, symptomatic a few days later, and they wanted to tell everybody. Well it became very clear that all those who were being notified had, you know, effectively been outed. And that's the kind of concern that one has. Um, I mean, there's so many interesting case studies. I mean, South Korea has got quite a few. And, uh, you know, that is the kind of fear that one would have. I think if you don't have the proper, you know, interdisciplinary, I'm going to make a plug for this here at the University of Waterloo. That's something that I know CPI is very interested in, but generally we all are which is it's a role for, you know, uh, you know, Plenio coming from the health side, Douglas from the technical side, I mean, bringing in people, ethicists, you know, how does this impact people of different races, right? I mean, I think that we know that there's going to be vulnerability built into the system. The fact that we have um, usually, for example, um, a lot of unfortunately poor people tend to be highly racialized, tend to be in dense environments, uh, we know that they also tend to have, um, you know, elderly people in their family, and so they're going to have more people in the household. I mean, what happens when you start to have, at a national scale, you know, uh, pinging of lots of activity of COVID outbreak in certain areas? You're stigmatizing an area, right? Um, and that may not be necessarily true. There's nothing indicative about, you know, community X for a reason why there's an outbreak. It's just that it's denser. It's poorer. And so you're adding that layer of stigmatization. So, I mean, I think that there's an opportunity for a public debate, for bringing in a number of, you know, many different disciplines into a conversation about, you know, what are the potential risks? Uh, and I, you know, again, I also don't see a lot of upside because I really feel like the analog system is working. <laughs> and there's no, there's no, I mean, it sounds, uh, you know, we don't have to digitize everything. Sometimes the good old fashioned analog way works. We don't need a digital solution to this. And to me, I just don't see in the cost benefit system here or a calculation, the real benefit in the long run when we have a very workable analog system that, you know, um, can be deployed. And again, back to the point of the labor market, right? Like we, you know, unemployment is going to be a serious problem in this country moving forward. And it's not very sophisticated to teach people how to make a phone call and find out um, through, you know, the probing the right questions, um, who's coming to contact with who. Um, and also, I mean, you, you can't guarantee that people won't not take their phone when they go places. I mean, that's something else that opens up to it. I mean, how many of us who are real paranoid people, and there's lots of us, don't get me wrong, might just switch to an analog phone, right? I mean, you know, good old flip phone. I mean, there's so many complications to this that I think that, again, sometimes the old-fashioned method is just uh, one that I would uh, find to be more resourceful. All right. Thank you, Besma. Uh, Douglas. Uh maybe even some technical measures. What do you think is important for transparency? Yeah, so I mean, I want to see as much technical information as I can to be able to assess the system. So 
at the very least, you know, detailed technical white papers about how the system is designed, how it's processing data, um, preferably open source implementations. Um, and, and fortunately, we are seeing that for the system that's currently under consideration by the federal government. So uh, this COVID Shield uh, app was designed by volunteers from Shopify and their source code is all publicly available on GitHub. And then the Canadian Digital Service, uh, which I only learned about recently, I guess is the Canadian government's open data initiative. Um, they've taken over development and all of their development is also uh, open source on GitHub. So I think that's a really good uh, measure. Um, but I think it's, so that, that's, that's in the design and development. But uh, as Plinio pointed out, I think it's also really important to be transparent um, once the system is deployed. Um, so uh, for the Alberta system that was deployed a couple months ago, um, I at least haven't been able to find any information about how many users have it installed, uh, how many exposures have I identified uh, with the tool. And I think we should have that information transparently reported as well. You know, over the course of the pandemic, we've seen governments and public health agencies ramp up their public reporting. You know, there's a daily report with new cases, new uh, across a variety of statistics. And I'd like to see the same thing for uh, any of these apps developed. Um, and it'll tell us whether or not these are effective. And I mean, there's the potential for embarrassment here, right? So if you know the app is deployed and after a month, you know, it's identified to exposures, well, that's a little bit embarrassing to the people who advocated for it, but at least we know and um, we can make informed decisions going forward from that. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, I will move uh, uh, to my concluding question, which is uh, we've already heard about uh, the new app um, uh, that is uh, uh, being proposed uh, by the Canadian government and the Ontario government. So uh, let me start with Besma this time. Uh, will you install the app proposed and why? And uh, if you want, would uh, install the app, how would you encourage other people to also install the app? I would not install the app. And yet, you know, I know I've asked um, you and others who are the real experts on the technical side. Um, and that did comfort me because you both said yes at the time. Uh, but you know what? I'm, I'm just too suspicious. I'm just too worried about where things are going to go. Um, and yeah, I mean, I'm going to err on the side of caution. Uh, and I'm going to say no, I wouldn't install it. Okay. That is a statement. Uh, Plinio. <laughs> Uh, I would definitely, I would definitely install it. Uh, not only we're, uh, I, I've seen the code, like it's very, it's, it's really well designed, very simple. It's focusing solely on content notification, which doesn't prevent like the app in the future to evolving into more darker modes of data collection, right? But as, as the app is right now, and I have an, a, an understanding of the technology, technological side that tells me that as it is, it's okay. And I'm always monitoring what's evolving in the space. So if in a few months or years, like the app starts to, to shift, I'll be the first one to, to delete it from my, from my, from my, um, from my app store. Uh, we're, we're also working with, uh, we, we're, I've been working with a group called COVID Watch, a group, a group of global volunteers that have been uh, designing a similar solution. And we had recent conversations with COVID Alert, which is the new uh, Canadian, Canadian solution that's going to be deployed. And I'm very, very happy to see with the, the, the approach they're taking. So yes, I would download it. And I think the if, the, if we want, I already mentioned this, but if we want people to download it, the, the, the government needs to be more transparent about it. There's a lot of good information about what's going on, what's happening that nobody knows about it, right? Like we had a conversation with the group like two or three days ago, and the last thing that we heard from, from the government was the prime minister and the premier announcement. There's, there was no further update about the development of that. Okay, well, thank you, Plinio. So Douglas, you can decide what the majority on the panel is. Uh, would you install the app? Uh, so, I mean, I've read the documentation on the Google Apple API. I've read the design documents and I've browsed some of the code on GitHub as well. So yeah, I'm willing to install it so far based on what I've seen. Um, but like Plinio, I'd wanna keep watching uh, and, and keep 
make, make sure that the scope doesn't change. Um, but I guess, you know, Florian, your question does have an implicit assumption in it that installation is voluntary. Um, and uh, I think Besma pointed out earlier um, that some countries have uh, made them mandatory. And, you know, I would have thought that that's incompatible, at least with Canada's tradition as a liberal democracy. But um, even, even, you know, sister countries that I think should have the same tradition uh, have flirted with that. So I think in April, the Prime Minister of Australia said it's voluntary as long as at least 40% of the people install it. And if 40% don't install it voluntarily, then it could become compulsory, right? So um, I think we have to, you know, be on, on the watch for that, uh, that tendency to ensure that this really is voluntary. Um, otherwise, public trust will be uh, very difficult to, to maintain. Okay, thank you very much. Um, would you do something to encourage Douglas uh, people to install the app? I think clear, honest communication uh, and lots of public review. So from the pandemic in general, the, the, the effective public leaders have seemed to have been the ones who've taken guidance from public health officials and acknowledged what they do and don't know at this time. Um, and I think everyone is making it up as they go, but you know, be honest about what you think will work and where you don't know things. And I think we have to be the same uh, about these types of tools to, to really provide an honest communication to the public. Um, good public review, um, get privacy commissioners involved, uh, get sign offs from as many you know, public uh, uh, academics and security professionals as we can get. Um, and I think maybe also be extra privacy conscious. So, um, you know, these things are going to have privacy policies. And I'm sure all 32 million Canadians are going to lead, read several pages of legalese privacy policies um, and that they'll be perfectly effective. Um, but if that's not the case, well, it's not going to be the case, then I mean, I think we need to design these from a privacy first perspective uh, where we're not just relying on whatever the privacy policy says, that we're actually designing these with the best interests at, at, in mind um, uh, from a, a kind of a data fiduciary responsibility, not just a legalistic privacy policy perspective. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Douglas. Thank you to all of the panelists so far. I will now open the questions to uh, uh, the audience. And please, if you have a question, put it in the chat. We already have a few questions. And I would like to address them uh, uh, to panelists. And I think the first question is best suited for Besma, uh, which is, what is the logic of having a conversation on contract tracing technology when leading countries like the US have built on contract tracing still pending, which could be very controversial? Uh, this does not place Canada as being just a follower, copycat of other countries that really uh, lead the global issues? Well, I mean, public, I mean, having a conversation is really important um, to be had in different communities. Uh, and, you know, we have, even across this country, we have different political cultures, right? Um, you know, what we would subscribe to perhaps as an Ontario political culture is very different than a Quebec political culture. So, you know, I don't think that um, any debate across the border is necessarily one that uh, follows uh, and can be applied uh, in Canada. And I think we need to have multiple conversations. And we need to have diverse voices at those conversations. I mean, it's just, again, I, I can't help but think about, you know, um, if we had, you know, four members of racialized communities on, on the screen, would they feel the same way? Would they feel just as comfortable downloading this, who have been far, far more chances of being securitized, um, far more chances of being surveilled already, have had, you know, not very good interaction with law enforcement. I mean, you know what I mean? So the more people you have from diverse voices, um, the better you're going to have that public debate. It's, it enriches it. And I think that's, I think that's a real, a really important way of understanding this. And, and I love Douglas's point about having ombudspersons and privacy commissioners. Um, I mean, they're, they're the real interlocutors to ensure um, that you really have that kind of independent uh, arm away from government because, you know, if you have, and, and with all due respect to people from public safety and, and, you know, Department of National Defense and the rest, but if you overly securitize this, 
um, then you also run, run the problem of it being seen as a security measure, right? And, and it really needs to be about public health. And I think that the health agencies, which are primarily provincial, need to be uh, really captains of this conversation with the, the involvement of ombudsperson and privacy commissioners. And last but not least, I think the one big challenge everyone's going to face is that this is still very much a provincial jurisdiction. Um, and I don't know if you're going to get the kind of, um, you know, political buy-in from all these different provincial leaders where this is clearly very much a provincial jurisdiction. And, you know, there's a lot of tension between provincial and federal governments that I don't know if you're going to get a very successful, you know, kind of Canada-wide deployed app um, under these circumstances. So that's something to think about. Um, yeah, I'll leave it there. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I ha would have now an interesting question and I would like to address this uh, to Douglas. Um, Douglas, why not require companies to commit to basic standards of confidentiality uh, on data use and collection that mandate serious penalties for purposeful misuse of trust to be permitted to collect data in the first place? Yeah, that's a good question. So, I mean, we already have pretty good privacy laws in Canada. There's PEPIDA uh, nationally, and then you know provincial privacy laws as well. As well, so you know those laws all operate under the prim primarily under the principle of consent uh, for collection and use. So you're consenting. Uh, to data being collected, a specific set of data being collected, and for a specific use of that data, and there are you know penalties um, for that, uh, if, if penalties for misuse of that data. Now, there are the the question asks about uh, purposeful misuse of data, and that's primarily what these types of uh, privacy legislation are are meant to address. So we do have tools to to uh, to to deal with that. Um, these tools don't have as much teeth as we would like. Um, BESMA might be able to correct me here if I'm wrong, but I believe you know, the Privacy Commissioner has a limited ability to actually uh, initiate investigations and, and cause penalties to happen. Um, so that, that's a little bit of a challenge. Um, but the other problem is um, if this data is collected, it may not be purposefully misused by the party that collects it, but that doesn't stop uh, a data breach um, or those who collect it from a data breach from misusing that data. So you know, the safest way to maintain confidentiality of data is to never have it in the first place, or at least minimize the amount of data you're collecting. Um, so that would be the approach I'd want to start from for these, these systems. And where we can't achieve those goals, um, then collect the minimum amount of data that would allow us to achieve those goals. Nagles, can I ask you a follow-up question? From a technical perspective, how do we detect uh, um, misuse of data? Uh, I have no idea. Um, <laughs> the, you know, we, yeah, I mean, once something's on the internet, I mean, there, there's the old law, once something's on the internet, it's you know, out of your control, it's, it's gone for good. Um, and that the, the same mostly holds here. I mean, there are a few techniques where you can, you know, put in some uh, honeypot uh, email addresses, and if that email address ever gets a spam, then you know that there's a data breach. Beyond that, uh, it's really hard. Maybe Florian, you have some ideas on from your experience uh, with, you know, data security. Uh, so, so I was asking the question because I think the only way we have it is to take this by whistleblowers, and uh, therefore. Um, uh, to have uh, technical measures in place that, as you said, prevent data from being collected in the first place uh, is uh, one of the few ways uh, we can avoid relying on whistleblowers, why we cannot solely rely on legal measures, in my opinion. And sorry, that was it's now my personal opinion, which I did not want to bring in, but uh, 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 that is just, just my perspective. Now, Plinio, I have a question for you. Um, there is another purpose that apps could have. What about real-time pandemic information collection for better response planning? Yeah, that, that is a major, major issue in public health, right? Like the, the delay that often happens between data collection and, and action, right? Um, from, as, a, as a public health uh, uh, person, like I would say that 
yes, like real time data would be really useful in order to reduce the reduce the spread of the pandemic by containing, controlling, like making sure that you're implementing the right the right uh, societal changes to 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 reduce the the progression of the pandemic. However, um, and I don't know if you if you read this book called uh, Weapons of Math Destruction. Uh, they talk extensively about how many of these algorithms can be misused, and that's something that concerns me. Right back to what Matt Vesma mentioned: uh, What if we start seeing like 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 uh, subsets of our population or, or like communities that are being negatively impacted by our, by by our actions just because they live in close quarters, and uh, consequently, we're going to see more and more cases in that region. Right? I think we need a very very uh, careful planning of how this data is going to be used. It, this applies to everything that we're talking about around contact tracing, content notification. Uh, the fact that we had three months, four months to design something, get it available to the public, and uh, start using the data is something that scares me a lot. Like I come from a background in the design of mobile health uh, apps for chronic diseases. And I can tell you, like if we're designing an app for patients with diabetes, it often takes us six months to a year to design and develop it because we take good measure in understanding what the needs are, making sure that the app is delivering what, what, it, what it's supposed to do, that we're using best practices to design the app. And in this rush, many of these best, best practices are being left behind. Thank you, Plinio. Um, Besma, before I come to you with a question after that, I would like to go back with the next question to Douglas. Uh, I apologize. Uh, but uh, we have a comment about uh, apps posing as legitimate ones, bogus apps that posing as legitimate ones, so a cybersecurity issue. Um, and uh, National reported on this a couple of days ago. Um, and we, uh, the, the poster is concerned that there is not enough information from the government about this. How do you feel, uh, Douglas, about this issue? Yeah, yeah, I saw that National Post article as well about um, uh, kind of a, a fake app uh, that was uh, being advertised as being from Health Canada. So that's that's a major concern. Um, and I just, uh, as I saw that question come up, I, I did a quick search in the Apple App Store for the word COVID, and there are pages and pages of results of COVID apps. So how is someone to know what is the right one? So, I mean, a small... Uh, a, a small saving grace is that um, Apple and Google have both said that in their app stores, they will only make the exposure notification API available to ones from, uh, for, to, to apps from public health authorities. So you know, the, the Bluetooth thing at least won't be available um, without Apple and Google's approval. But that doesn't stop you know, apps that are just trying to collect contact information, photos, do cryptocurrency mining, whatever in the background, general malware. Um, we're going to have to rely on good public communication. Um, will it be a flyer in the in the mail from your local health authority saying scan this QR code? You know that might be the type of communication we have to rely on um, to get that information out. But it's it's a major concern. Okay, thank you. Uh, now, Besma, I have a really good question for you. I really like this question. Okay. Uh, <laughs> what consequences will there be for the app makers and governments if these apps un do end up violating privacy or being misused? Police chief in Minnesota uses contract tracing to identify out-of-state protesters. Yeah, I mean that's again part of a uh, part of the public conversation that needs to be had, right? I mean, you know, what do we want? What is the punishment, right? Um, I mean, usually these things because they tend to not fall in the in the realm of, of criminal end up being fines. Um, and that's just not good enough, right? Um, and again, that's another thing too. I mean, just, you know, increasingly we're just starting to raise our, our just consciousness of, you know, our data. And we don't have the kinds of provisions like the Europeans have, right? About really thinking about our data as, as something that we own. Uh, we, we tend to kind of pick and choose a little bit from the European model and the American model, which is an all free for all. Um, you know, and that, that worries me. I mean, there's a lot of things that we're just starting to get the level of consciousness. I know CPI has been working on this in terms of just raising awareness about a lot of these issues, which, you know, are just starting, Canadians are just starting to understand this idea that, you know, you put a picture on Facebook, guess what, you don't own that picture anymore, and you can find it on a billboard, you know, in, in Minnesota, right? I mean, that's the kind of stuff that, again, our data is, is so um, valuable 
obviously not just for personal reasons, but it has a monetary value, right? It, it can be monetized and it can be securitized and it can be misused. And so that's the kind of stuff that I think uh, we're just starting to raise consciousness about it. And so I don't think we're even, frankly, Canadians are really prepared to really grasp what it means uh, when someone else or some entity has your data. What's the fine of you know, a government taking that data and then also the metadata, you know, the compilation of it all and selling it to an insurance firm, selling it to all these other entities. I mean, that's the kind of stuff that also, again, we're just starting to have consciousness about, and I think we need more, more of these kinds of public conversations. And that's why we need CPI to do more of these kinds of webinars. We should make this a weekly event, right? Plinio, <laughs> uh, uh, I have a question for you. You looked at the app. Um, and the question is, in terms of app installation, how can the majority of Canadians who are not part of, and uh, she used the word academic ivory tower, become motivated enough to install an app? So how can it work? It looks like the panelists who would install the app support their view partly based on their technical assessment of these apps. But this isn't something a majority of Canadians are capable of doing. How can you transfer your trust to others and your assessment to others? I think events like this are those channels, right? Like events and publications by groups like CPI, the Canadian the Cybersecurity and Privacy Institute, for example, right? Uh, we, we have the technical expertise to assess the app and understand if it's moving in the right direction. So what I want to see, like both provincially and federally, depending, depending on how these apps are deployed, are like strong involvement from third parties, from organizations, agencies that have nothing to do with the with the government that are not benefiting from from the development and deployment of that app, and I want to see these groups ass uh, assessing the the code and letting the public know if the the, the app is being properly designed. Right, uh, there are a number of groups around the world that have been doing this, and I think that. It, it is hard to transfer this trust for sure because we're asking, basically asking someone else to trust us in the information that we're providing. However, uh, the the complexity, like we're not only talking about um, the, the the public that would not have the technical expertise to understand the software, but we may also be, be talking about uh, seniors that don't have the cognitive ability anymore to, to understand like not even what we are telling them and still going to be required or it would still benefit from downloading the app. So it is a long journey for sure. And again, the way of doing it is to involve other parties, third parties in the process so that, that the transparency can be achieved. Okay. Thank you, Plenio. Um, Besma, I want to uh, uh, pitch the next question to you because uh, I think you have uh, uh, experience in this. Uh, and the, the, the viewer is asking, another concern is the digital divide and the lack of smartphone ownership among groups that are particularly vulnerable uh, to those diseases, including the elderly and the poor, um, yeah. or underrepresented groups. Right, and look, this, this, um, these contact tracing apps only work with a smartphone, right? Um, and so, yeah, you know, I mean, I know a lot of elderly folks have these wonderful, you know, digital, or sorry, I should say these, um, um, these flip phones that, you know, basically have three, four numbers on it, and there's none of the lovely gadgets that all of our smartphones have. That's not going to work on those phones. So that's another issue. And certainly, yes, of course. I mean, if, if we've learned anything about the epidemiology of this, of this virus and who it really affects the most, it's the elderly. Um, and, you know, smartphone penetration, you know, clearly is, is lopsided. It's far more likely to be in the hands of younger people than older people. And so that's a challenge, right? Um, and then sort of, you know, you start to wonder, well, what's, you know, if you can't really get that kind of penetration. Um, so that digital divide is very important. The other thing too is the rural urban, um, you know, again, not to say that um, a lot of folks in the rural area do have uh, smartphones, but there's definitely less uh, less connectivity there in some places. They certainly don't have all of the um, um, same um, you know access, and so th these are all I think issues of concern for sure. The digital divide is an important part of this. Thank you. Very right, much. If you let me just pop in with an extra thought on that one, um, I just want to offer a slightly contrasting thought to what Besma is saying. Um, that maybe we can start to think this a little bit in terms of how we think about vaccinations. So flu vaccinations, um, uh, not everyone can take a flu vaccination. Those uh, immunocompromised, uh, elderly or young, 
Um, but there's still benefit to them for other people um, getting vaccinations because it reduces the ability, uh, the, the R0, the spreading factor. Um, and so we can, we can see this as something of a parallel to that. So if, if an app like this ultimately helps reduce the spread, then it is a benefit to those who don't have it installed uh, still. Um, and perhaps even answering that, that, that approach also can help with uh, the question just asked of Plinia about how to convince Canadians to, to adopt it. If we can kind of say, send the same type of story that we use for getting the, you know, the annual flu shot, then that might also help with understanding the role that this plays. Thank you, Douglas. I have another comment from a viewer that uh, uh, takes another perspective on this, which he says, like, earlier this week, the New York Times reported manual contract tracers in that city having trouble finding infected people or getting people to respond to phone calls. I'm not sure it's true that manual contract tracing works perfectly all the time everywhere. So we have problems on both sides. And now let me try and uh, 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 get this debate to, to um, uh, uh, Plinio, we have a question here. If the app is not widespread enough to cover the majority of Canadians, could this lead to people going undiagnosed if they have symptoms, but never getting a notification, there therefore they would not be concerned? And what would be the impact of that? Yeah, that is that is a major concern for sure. Like the over-trusting on these technologies, right? Like we, once the, the, the apps are in the market or the app is in the market and people are downloading and using it, they will have the expectation that that app in front of them will be their, their source of truth, right? That, 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 that the, the notifications would come through that app. So yes, that is definitely a problem. Like if we're not able to reach like 60 to 70%, 60 to 80% of pervasiveness in like localized communities, you may have a situation where you got in contact with someone that was not using the app, potentially got sick and you would never know about it. So what we're going to see in the in the next few months, uh, you can be sure that the Public Health Agency of Canada will not give up the traditional contact tracing. They will continue with their phone calls while the app is ramping up. And if the app is able to reach the, the necessary number of downloads, at that point, there may be, we may start seeing a trade-off there, right? Like where we're reducing the number of uh, phone calls and rely, relying a little bit more on the app. But I, I think it all goes back to what Douglas was saying that we need, like, it's not only about deploying the app. We need constant reports about how many people are downloading it, how many people are using the app, how many notifications have been sent by the app, because that will inform us and tell us how much we can trust that information. But again, there's a difference between showing numbers and showing something that the, the public can understand. So it's very, very important to, to design this, this communication very carefully just we don't want a dashboard full of numbers right we need to specifically tell what they mean and what the impact for the population is thank you very much Plinio. and uh, with this i think we are at the end of the uh, uh, panel i would like to thank my panelists very much again i would like to also thank the audience for attending this panel um, i apologize to every question we could not take in the interest of time um, however, I would encourage everyone to participate in the way they want to in this very dis interesting experiment of rolling out the app. As my personal opinion, to make it three against one, I would also install the app, as I have commented in the uh, uh, Globe and Mail. Um, and I would encourage, in my perspective, to do that, everyone. We will definitely have a follow-up on this. So at the very least, in October, we have the... Um, uh, Cybersecurity and Privacy Institute annual meeting, and I encourage everyone uh, in this series of events, we will likely have a follow-up event of seeing how this uh, experiment of rolling out a uh, contract tracing app has evolved until that point of time. And I hope to see everyone there again. And uh, thank you again uh, uh, for attending this panel, and uh, uh, hope uh, thank you again to all, all of my three panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Florian. Thank you, Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone.